So Pilate sent the soldiers to break the legs of those that were on the cross so that they would not hang there on the cross during the solemn Sabbath of the Passover. But the text tells us when they came to Jesus, they they did not need to break his legs to hasten his death because he was already dead. But instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. Again, attesting to the fact that Jesus was dead at that point. Friends, would you pray with me? God, especially for this day, we give you thanks for our nation, for our freedoms, especially the freedom we have to gather in worship this day. We know, God, that many, many of our sisters and brothers around the world lack this freedom because so many governments are so threatened by those of us who follow a king that is beyond all earthly kings. So we give you thanks for this freedom that we share, and we pray that this freedom will grow and increase across the globe, especially among the persecuted church. God, thank you for gathering us in this place. May we never, never take this freedom for granted or take it lightly. As we gather to worship you this day, O oh God, we pray that we will have ears to hear what you're saying to each one of us on this day. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The founder of the Methodist revival movement, that preacher, John Wesley, in the 18th century, was very, very, very opposed to the Methodist in America, in the colonies, going to war in rebellion against the king. John Wesley wrote several times to American Methodists saying that God has instituted a hierarchy of authority in the world and that in that hierarchy of authority there is the divine right, the divine placement of kings. So John Wesley had a strong issue with us in our war of independence against the motherland, against the monarchy in the motherland. Every Methodist preacher in America at the time that the Revolutionary War broke out returned home to England, except one, Francis Asbury, who became the first American bishop of the church here. The war went on. John Wesley dealt with it. And I'm so grateful John Wesley got over his anger toward us. And after the War of Independence was won by the American colonies, John Wesley set about to bless us in any way that he could bless us. And one of the first things John Wesley did was to abridge the Book of Common Prayer, to send it to the Methodists here in the colonies to guide our worship. And in the preface to that Book of Common Prayer for American Methodists, John Wesley wrote this. As our American brethren are now totally disentangled both from the state and from the English hierarchy, we dare not entangle them again, either with one or the other. They are now at full liberty. I almost sense some excitement here on the part of Mr. Wesley. They are now at full liberty, simply to follow the scriptures and the primitive church. And we judge it best, says Mr. Wesley, that they should stand fast in that liberty wherewith God has strangely made them free. God has strangely made us free from the mother country. And John Wesley just hoped and he prayed that we would take this opportunity to stand firm, stand fast in the liberty that God gives us. Friends, I hope that today you are very, very grateful for the liberty we have in this land, particularly for that liberty regarding the freedom of religion. 
but I hope that even more so today, you are grateful and mindful of the liberty that is ours in Jesus Christ. What has been won for us through the work of Jesus Christ. Our forefathers and our foremothers there in the generation of the Revolutionary War knew, knew well that our God had called us to that moment, our God had provided for us for that moment, and our God had led us through that conflict, and our God was doing a new thing in the American colonies. So I hope that you give thanks for the freedom that we have as Americans, I especially this morning. Hope that you are overwhelmed with gratitude for the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. I hope that you so know the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ, that you're so living into the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ, that every one of us will leave this place this morning a little freer than we were when we came in. Because there's so much in life from which Jesus wants to set us free. We're continuing in our sermon series looking at basic Christian convictions, and it is a perfect day to look at a phrase from the Apostles' Creed that is one of the strangest phrases in the Creed, the only phrase that has elicited any concern or controversy in the Christian community. It is that phrase, He, Jesus, descended to hell. And we're going to look at that phrase and ask what does it mean to profess, as the Apostles' Creed says, he, Jesus, descended to hell. And hopefully we will be reminded again of the freedom that's ours in Jesus Christ. What does that phrase mean, he descended to hell? What did our early church fathers and mothers intend for us to profess by professing that he, Jesus, descended to hell. Well, it is a rather strange, because it's strangely translated into the English phrase from the Apostles' Creed. And as soon as I start talking about that phrase, he descended to hell, you Methodists should quickly realize we don't use it. It's not part of our profession of the creed. It's there in the hymnal. It's a footnote to the Apostles' Creed. So as a Methodist, you need to know two things. What does it mean? What are we professing when we say it? Because we agree with that. And why don't we use it? So let me start by saying what it does not mean. And this is the concern from the phrase itself, he descended to hell. And we agree about this across the Christian community. As a matter of fact, it was Martin Luther who first reminded Protestants why this phrase is problematic unless you interpret it correctly. And you really cannot interpret it correctly if you use the English, he descended into hell. But that's the traditional way it was written into English, he descended into hell. So what can this phrase definitely not mean? Well, it definitely cannot mean that Jesus, after his death, went to the place of torment, hell, went to the place where the wicked people of the world go upon death. He did not go into the fires of hell after he died. It cannot mean that. And we know that. Martin Luther reminded us that we've read the scripture. We've heard Jesus say, remember, to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me. Where? Paradise. He did not say, this day you'll be with me in hell, to that thief on the cross. So he cannot mean that he went to the place of eternal torment where the damned will reside for eternity. And that's what the church means by the word hell. So we know that it cannot mean, we also know that it cannot mean that Jesus did something between his death and his resurrection that added to the work that he accomplished there on the cross. We know that it cannot mean that he did something on the cross, and then after he did something on the cross, he went and did something else in addition during those days that he was dead before his resurrection. The reason we know it cannot mean that is, again, we've heard Jesus. We remember Jesus saying there from the cross, it is finished. 
He didn't say it's almost finished. I got a little more work to do after I die in some other place. So we know this in the Christian community. These are the reasons that phrase is problematic. We also know that it cannot mean that there is any possibility of a post-mortem second chance to receive the love of God. You reject the love of God in this life, you will go on rejecting the love of God in the next life. So we know that it cannot mean a second chance because, again, the Bible is very clear. As it says in the book of Hebrews, it is appointed unto us once to die and then the judgment. So no second chance. By the way, no reincarnation. It is appointed unto us once to die and then the judgment and then the eternity in light of the judgment. So in the Christian community, we've been very clear as we've taught this concept for about 1,800 years from the creed that it cannot mean these things. But sometimes when people profess he descended to hell, they, they, they just default into believing some of those things. So we Methodists, or like some other parts of the body of Christ, it's there, we believe it, but it's a footnote. We also acknowledge that that phrase, he descended into hell, was not in the original creed. It only showed up in the creed about 200 years later. And one of the reasons we think it was not in the original creed is it is a redundant phrase. When you understand what the phrase means. It's a redundant phrase, and you've already professed it in the creed, so you don't need to say it again. So we've looked at what that cannot mean, and we have a consensus in the Christian community. It cannot mean those things. So what does it mean? What our early church fathers and mothers were teaching us to remember is simply that Jesus really, really died. It was not a quasi-death. It was not a seeming death. There were some people in the early Christian community because of our conviction that, that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, they thought they were making the next logical step and saying if he's God, he, he could not really die. He just seemed to die. But the scriptures are clear. Christian tradition is clear. He really, really died. So what the church has meant by he descended to hell is he descended to the place of the dead. Or he descended to Hades. Now again, it is problematic in the modern church because even some of you said, sitting here today, you think that the word Hades is just a polite way of saying hell. And that's not true. In the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Hades and hell are two separate places, two separate concepts. Hades is just the Greek translation of the Hebrew word that's throughout the Old Testament, Sheol. So Sheol, Hades, is just the place of the dead. Not the place of eternal torment where the wicked go, just the place of the dead. By the time of Jesus, we see this in the New Testament, uh, the, the realm of the dead has sort of divided into the place for the wicked and the place for the righteous. And that's why we see by the time of Jesus, there's a, new, a couple new phrases being used for the place of the dead, for the place of the righteous dead. The phrase, Abraham's bosom. Remember that from the New Testament? Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. And then, of course, there's the phrase that Jesus used, paradise. So what the church has always taught is that he's gone to the place of the dead. He went to the place of the dead. He really, really, really died. He did not need to go anywhere to add to the work of the cross. Now, we all acknowledge that during the Middle Ages, uh, a lot of Christians, because we are imaginative people, uh, began to wonder what Jesus did when he went to the place of the dead. And they begin to say that maybe that's when he went and preached to all the Old Testament saints. Perhaps that's when he went and offered salvation to all those who had gone before. There's a problem with that, though. The problem with that is we, we've read the book, the Bible. Uh, the Old Testament saints are part of the redeemed. The New Testament is very clear about that. 
The Old Testament saints are part of the redeemed. When Jesus talked about the eternal kingdom, Jesus said part of the eternal kingdom is we'll know each other and you will get to sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So obviously they're there. But the New Testament even gets a little clearer than that. There did not need to be a second work of Christ to save the Old Testament saints. And that's what developed in the Middle Ages that during this interim period between death and resurrection, Jesus went and uh, helped out Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Old Testament saints. The New Testament is very clear. They were part of the redeemed. And as a matter of fact, the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament saints are part of the redeemed for the same reason we are, in the same way that we are. And I'm glad the New Testament makes that clear. It is a remarkable book. I I encourage you to read this book that we call the Bible. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, that New Testament book, you see this lengthy conversation using a list, a lengthy list of Old Testament saints. And these Old Testament saints are being used as examples for us to follow And as a matter of fact, when the conversation ends, that list of saints from the Old Testament, the author of Hebrews says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all those has been named in chapter 11, all those Old Testament saints, we should run the race with faith. So they're there. They're part of the redeemed. But I'm so glad in that same passage in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the author not only celebrates they're part of the redeemed, but why they're part of the redeemed And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, the author says, speaking of all the Old Testament saints that he's been speaking about, that all of these, he says, died in faith. And in that list is Enoch and Adam and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, it goes on and on and on. The author says all of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. So what the author of Hebrews is saying succinctly, which we know from the whole tenor of the Bible, is there's only been one way that people have ever been saved or redeemed or delivered, by faith. And these Old Testament saints had faith in God. They lived by faith. Remember when Abraham was told to go forward, he just went forward, went forth not even knowing where he was going. These Old Testament saints lived by faith and they died by faith. And that author there in Hebrews said it was almost as if they had such a faith in the promises of God They knew that the promises of God would be greater and greater and greater. It is almost as if they received faith by living in anticipation of what would come one day in Jesus Christ. So Jesus didn't need to go and do more work after the cross. The cross was sufficient. When he declared it's finished, his work was finished. So that's why we think to say he descended to hell or to really say it in the proper translation he descended to Hades or the place of the dead we're being redundant because we just have said he was he suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead in case you were wondering and buried he really 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 died that's all that phrase in the creed means we have almost universal consensus in that that's all that phrase in the creed means and it is redundant because you've already said he really really died in the creed and the use of the word there erroneously hell uh, confuses people but that just kind of got in the tradition and you know how we Christians are once we do it for a couple hundred years we can't stop doing it so it's there in the tradition that's the way the English is translated so we Methodists feel like we're justified in saying we believe everything that part of the creed says but just to keep our folks from getting confused, we drop it out and leave it as a footnote. So what you need to know when you look at that phrase from the creed is what you've already professed in the creed. He really, really suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. He really died and was buried for you and for me. He faced death, hell, and the grave for us in his life and in the cross. 
And he conquered all that death, hell, and the grave through the cross. And we know that because it was declared to be true with resurrection. So Jesus Christ fearlessly died our death for us. And we get to live the life that Jesus Christ gives us now through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we can live fearlessly. I hope that we can live fearlessly. I hope that we're all living fearlessly. I hope that we're all choosing faith instead of fear. There's nothing that life can do to prevail over us. The worst that life can do to us is to take our earthly life and to hasten us on to the other side. And while there's always a tragic aspect to death, death at the end of the day for the believer is not a tragedy. Now, I believe that for most of us who are Christians, we really don't fear death. We fear the difficult passage sometimes between now and death. We fear what we may have to go through to make the transition. And that's reasonable, that's acceptable. None of us want to embrace pain. And that's why Paul, by the way, called death the last enemy to be defeated. So if you fear the process of dying, that's okay. But please don't fear death. Please don't fear what's on the other side. Someone has gone and checked it out and come back and told us it's okay. We don't have to fear the other side. That's why John Wesley, when he's dying and his friends are gathered around him there in his home in London, one of the last things he said was, best of all, God is with us. Not only for this life, but for the world to come. And I think I've told you about my friend Raz McKinney. He was one of the first funerals I did decades ago when I came to High Point at the old Motley Avenue United Methodist Church. I'll never forget Raz's passing. He was in the intensive care unit at the what was then the new High Point Regional Hospital. And I went to see him, and because of the tube, he couldn't speak to us. He'd had a severe stroke. He knew he was on his way out. But I'll never forget what Raz McKinney did for my sake as I was walking out of that intensive care room, as I was walking out of that intensive care room, I heard knocking, and I turned around, and Raz McKinney was knocking on his bedside table. He was knocking to get my attention, because when I turned around, he just gave me a thumbs up to let me know he knew that it was okay. He died for Raz, he died for you, he died for me. It was a real death, and now we need not fear it because he's already gone through death for us. Today we're celebrating the independence we have here in this nation, and that's an important thing to do to remember and to give thanks for the freedoms that we have here. I hope that as you celebrate the freedom that we have here in this land today, you particularly remember the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. Because that's where our truest, greatest freedom comes from. That's where we find the freedom to live fearlessly in this world, to live and die fearlessly in this world. And we are grateful for the freedoms that we have in this land to do exactly what we're doing here this morning On this day, of all days especially, we should gather and do this because so many of our brothers and sisters around the world can't do this without fear of retribution. But we gather and we give thanks to God for who God is and we give thanks to God for our nation. I'm very grateful for our nation. I hope you are too. And we remind ourselves on this day how important the freedoms of our nation are. And we're also mindful on these days how fragile these freedoms can be. Let me tell you about John Asbury Owens as I finish. I'm I'm sure I've told you before that because of my love of genealogy, I know that Patterson blood has been spilled in every American conflict except 
except the Mexican-American War, 1848-1849, and the Spanish-American War in 1898. But in all the other conflicts that the colonies in the United States of America fought, Patterson blood was spilt. And particularly during the Civil War. Can you imagine such? During the Civil War, when we were killing each other, I had great-grandfathers and a great-grandfather who fought in the Civil War. And my family were up in the mountains of western North Carolina. And if you know our history, you know that in the mountains of western North Carolina, it was, it was a very divided place between the Union and the Confederacy. It was rather like the mountains of West Virginia that pulled out and became a separate state during the Civil War because, again, in a mountainous region like there in Virginia or western North Carolina, there were no large plantations. And there were people who didn't want to fight on behalf of what they perceived to be the people who, are, who owned the large plantations. So in the mountainous regions of Virginia and North Carolina, it was very divided. And all of my great-grandfathers fought on the side of the Confederacy. But then there's John Asbury Owens. He was my great-grandfather. John Asbury Owens, and by the way, notice that middle, that good middle Methodist name. John Asbury Owens in Franklin, North Carolina, my great-grandfather, was a veteran of the Civil War. He had my grandmother in 1896 when he was very old, and my, my grandmother had my father when she was up in years. So I grew up with my grandmother, and she told me about John Asbury Owens, her dad. Uh, some, I wish I'd have been smart enough to have asked for more information, but she told me about her father, John Asbury Owens, who died in 1905 when she was 10 years old. But one of the things I know about John Asbury Owens is this. He was up there in Franklin, North Carolina, and the land was divided, and John Asbury Owens, my great-grandfather, contrary to what all my great-great-grandfathers did, when Tennessee fell to the Union... He went across the mountains and joined the Union Army. I think, and I think I know this, I hope I know this, part of me tells me I know this, that the reason he did that when he was about 23 years old toward the end of the war, I think he finally got to the conclusion that this grand American experiment was worth saving. I can't imagine the peer pressure he had to deal with uh, from just other family members and when he went and joined the Union Army in Tennessee. But something told him preserving the Union was worth the effort. I just drove a couple of weeks ago to Lake Junaluska to participate in a Methodist ordination service and something broke my heart. Between here and Lake Junaluska on I-40, if you've driven it recently, you've probably seen it. Between here and, and Lake Junaluska on I-40, there are two huge Confederate flags flying on the left as you go west. When I first saw those, I, I just thought, you know, that would break my great-grandfather's heart. That, that there's a flag other than the star-spangled banner that any of us would fly. I'm glad that though we've been tested in so many ways here in this land, that we keep returning to the fact that this American experiment is worth all of our effort, worth our blood, sweat, and tears. Hopefully we remember that on days such as this, when we walk in here unmolested and worship the living God. Friends, I wish for you a wonderful Independence Day. But more importantly, I wish for you a wonderful, wonderful, freedom-filled life in Jesus Christ.